Hey everyone. So we're going to just talk a bit about the very important topic of family governance today on governing a family business um, and kind of what that means. I'll start out by giving a bit of an example of why that's important. But, you know, in, in a nutshell, you, you think of family governance, you're thinking of governance of any kind is really the way in which an organization or a group of people make decisions. It could be a country, it could be a business, it could be a nonprofit. Um, but how do they uh, collectively uh, make uh, decisions efficiently in a manner that's consistent with um, the way the organ organization uh, wants to project itself and its objectives and things of that nature? So, um, so let's let's keep going here. So, uh, so I want to just highlight a study. And this study um, was written by two scholars out of Italy. Uh, and the university that they are in, they are uh, both professors in the economics and business department. And they both have interests in the areas of uh, strategic management, corporate governance, and family business in particular. Um, and one of the researchers also has a, a slight twist in uh, research focus, which includes also um, the special focus on institutional context and the role of emotions within the context of uh, governance of a family business, right? So it's a very important piece of, of, of the puzzle um, in terms of family businesses. So family firms, which is an interesting data point here, represents about 70 to 95% of all business entities in most countries around the world. Um, and this is according to the Europe, European Family Business Journal uh, from 2012. They produce an estimated 70 to 90% of all global GDP annually. And this is according to the Family Firm Institute, right? Uh, also, they employ about 60% of the, of the global workforce. So you can see just from this clip, this little piece of information here, that family businesses are essential, an essential, currently an essential part of global economic um, viability, and it's uh, persistent in all countries, um, maybe more a bit more in some than others, but for the most part, you see it um, everywhere. So it's very important to understand if you happen to form a family business, um, how should that look and how can you uh, start to set up the structure, right? So the book addresses the questions of uh, emerging trends, of governance and management of family businesses. And, and he goes on to say that governance and management systems embody structures, relationships, norms, incentives, values, and goals that generate specific organizational propensities. Okay, let me read that one more time, right? Governance and management systems embody structures, relationships, norms, incentives, values, and goals that generate specific organizational propensities. So this is a very key portion of structuring, properly structuring a family enterprise, okay? The uh, uh, corporate finance part of it, of course, is important. Also, the strategy is important. Um, the areas of focus or core companies are, are important. Um, succession planning is, is important, and that's a bit of governance. But governance kind of encompasses a lot of these different pieces and, um, and uh, sets the framework to uh, so people can understand how to structure their, 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 their business. So before we go any further with the conversation on how to actually structure, let's just take a little bit of a historical look in terms of why this topic is important and where it's kind of coming from. The evolution of, and this is based in, uh, in Italy, right? Talking about the evolution of the Italian family business and its jurisdictional, and its, uh, a, a judicial uh, uh, context. So, uh, the head of the family, right? So if you think about it, and I'll go back into, you know, the times of the Greeks and the Romans, and that's where the, um, the Italian society kind of emerged out of, you had two kind of maybe competing or different, or different uh, ways of organizing their society based on the economics that they were dealing with. The Greeks were dealing with, um, were dealing with an economy where there would be a lot of trading uh, going on. 
and the Romans were dealing with a largely agricultural uh, economy. So in the Greek society, right, uh, in, you know, many, 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 many years ago, right, um, predating kind of maybe ancient times, think of, think of it that way, um, their family structures uh, were set up in a way where uh, the, the child in that family would be given a, a good amount of autonomy and um, basically would be released at 18 years old from the family in, in, in theory to go out into the world and, and, and kind of um, get their uh, trading going and get different things going for their own uh, economic viability, right? Whereas in the Roman society, that was not the case, right? The head of the family held all the power in the family because they were agricultural. And in an agricultural society, uh, a lot of discipline and hard work had to be done in order to make sure that you get the right crop yields and things of that nature. So the family structure stayed very much hierarchical up to the uh, you know, eldest male, uh, typically. And, and that would stay that way until that person died and the next you know, person would kind of take over. That so very different constructs because of economic forces in those two societies. Now you kind of merge those into um, maybe modern day Italy, and you would think, and you would uh, see that the the um, and this is you know uh, pre uh, nineteen seventy five, right? Um, you had a society, or actually pre World War, I would say World War Two. I believe it, the, the book went on to say. This agricultural society was still the, propon, um, the dominant uh, economic uh, model for most families, and it was the preponderant um, of all uh, economic activity. So, over you know the majority of folks, right, um, forty-five percent or so, were in agricultural um, endeavors, and it, and that persisted um, through the uh, through World War II. So, um, and then that started to wane a bit as the industrial revolution started to, you know, reach uh, different parts of the world. And you saw a lot more, um, a lot less, maybe over a 10 year period, I think it was between 1950 and 60 or 60 and 70, I can't remember the exact time frame, but anyway, you saw that number of 40% agriculture go down to 30% and industrial um, uh, uh, occupations went up to about 40%. So that was like the new preponderant amount of activity. So the economic structure, right, uh, for folks had shifted. And that means that, you know, the family structure also is going to have to adjust and adapt to this new reality because folks are going to have to have a different way to um, um, get their economic viability and, and, and survive, basically. An interesting thing that also came out of the reading, right, and was talked about the legal framework set in 1975. And this was a framework and a family law reform that actually compelled or stipulated that, um, you know, relatives and spouses and second degree, uh, um, relatives in the third and second degree and spouses, etc., those who work um, in within the, the, the construct of the family business would, um, would have the legal right to share in the uh, important decisions and profit and cash upon sale of, of, the, of, the, of, the, um, um, of the business and also any profit that's worked proportional to the work they, perf uh, to the, they perform. The work could have be could be of any of any kind, right? It could be intellectual work, manual work, executive work, directive work, um, but it has to be functional and germane to the uh, company activity. The law actually also went on to talk about how um, even if the uh, um, person is doing work that allows another person in the family to do the work. So let's say that, you know, I'm in a family, but I'm, I'm doing the childcare, which allows my spouse to go out and do the family business work. I still, I'm entitled to some level of compensation, right? Um, and decision-making and um, access to uh, all the, to some of the profits because I'm, I'm supporting the business and it may be a secondary way, but I'm still supporting the business and the law actually protects those people also. Um, so, 
So this, you know, in, in conclusion, they, they, although the law, you know, tried to clarify the situation um, and detail it, the law uh, defining the possible, all the possible cases, um, it's still hard to, you know, control the family business as, as, as a bit of a, as a bit of a phenomenon, right? The hardest point um, of concern is the identification and clarification of the complex, com um, complicated structure of the company and the family, right? And then we can also talk about, you know, the emotional versus the rational, right? So the emotional nurturing um, side of the family business that needs, that, of the family itself that needs to raise adults, basically, you know, the function of the family, um, versus the the rational cold calculating uh, portion of the of the family business that actually needs to make business decisions and those two things a lot of times get uh, interwoven and may need to be separated or at least thought about in a way that's constructive uh, to both sides getting what's needed okay so I will stop there and um, I will have another video shortly following thank you